Right, so if you interpret these, these, these two, uh, these are the interpretations of Fry and Daubert. I'll let you look at that uh, later by yourself. But basically, the Fry standard says uh, where novel evidence is at, at issue, the Fry uh, allows the judiciary to refer scientific expertise to the general acceptance, everybody out there. And again, that takes time. In the Daubert standard, you don't have to be quite so strict. You can allow it in as long as it's reasonable. <clears throat> and it fits one or several of those uh, requirements that I listed before, and then l chance the consequences to the jury or to the uh, adversarial system of, of the way that we work our, our, our courts. Okay, so that's, that, that's a big difference. Now, where and when is this used? Um, well, it's, it, the, the, the Fry standard uh, is, is still used in typically local municipal courts. The Daubert standard is used in all federal cases and in about half the states. So both standards exist. Both standards work in different places. So if you're in federal court, everything is the Daubert standard. If you're in a state court, it could be either Fry or Daubert. If you're in a municipal court, it's almost, uh, almost well, it's very likely that that'll be the Fry standard. And the reason for that is because when you're talking about a very local case, you're talking about people who have probably the least level of scientific understanding. And so they're going to rely upon precedent of other court cases and the scientific community in general. If you're talking about federal evidence or like state uh, appellate court or, or state supreme court, they have met much more in terms of, their, uh, of uh, uh, resources available to them. So they are in a better position to, to, to really gauge this stuff. Um, feder federal judges actually have to take training um, and, and have to learn a little bit about the science in order to in order to deal with these court cases. And um, they also have their own little expertise that, that each one works with, so. Okay, now the third case uh, is, a, is, is called the Joiner case. And this is a case in which, um, that forms the trilogy here, um, in, in which the um, plaintiffs said that PCBs caused cancer. And so what needed to be established here was the connection between PCBs and cancer. Uh, they were suing the manufacturer of, uh, of, of these chemicals. So this one refers to what an expert witness can talk about in court. So an expert witness, let me use an example. If I'm a chemist, I can go on the court and I, I can become an expert witness and have been expert witness to talk about things that uh, are, first of all, relevant to the case and are within my level of expertise. And as long as, I, as long as I've used prudent methods, everything is okay. But I can't go in and testify on forensic anthropology, or I can't go in and testify on uh, automotive safety, or whatever. I can't, I, I, I have limitations. And I can't talk about just anything I want to. It has to be particularly relevant and only relevant to this, this, this one case, the case at hand. Right? So in this case, conclusions and, it says, and methodology are not separate. There is a connection between how I'd run the experiments and the information that I've got and the conclusion that I make, what I say to the court. This was likely to have been the cause of, of whatever I observe. Okay, so it, it says that experts are allowed to extrapolate from um, existing data and then to render an opinion to the court um, that connects the data and the opinion. But there must be a close relationship between the data and their opinion. In other words, their opinion must be based upon fact. It must be based upon um, experimentable, measurable, triable pieces of information. Just can't walk in and say, mm, I think that's, that's the case. You, know, you, you just can't make up an opinion. It's got to be a substanti substantiable opinion. All right, so, so that's what happened in, 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 in the Joyner case. Now this, there's, there's another case, and I don't know how this counts in, a tr in, a, in the trilogy, but the, the, uh, the, the Kumo tire case goes specifically to this particular point. Uh, and there are, again, there aren't very many cases, maybe half a dozen we'll talk about, but this is number four. Uh, this was a case that established um, even more firmly the aspect of expert testimony. And it was a case in which there was an accident and the plaintiffs sued Kumo Tire Company, which still exists, uh, for 
a defect in the tire. In other words, there was a, a they, they said there was a defect in the tire, the tire blew out, there was an accident caused because of a faulty, of a faulty tire. And so they sued Kumo Tire. Um, so the, um, the plaintiff sought an expert who could go in and say, um, yes, it was the fault of the tire. Because Kumo was arguing that, well, it, it could be a variety of things that caused that blowout. It could be a puncture, which they have no control over. It could be somebody inflated the tire too low or too high. It could be a lot of things outside of the control of, of Kumo, and it wasn't really their fault, obviously. That, that's what they said. Okay, so, so that's what was going on. Now, um, the, uh, the plaintiff went out and got expert testimony to have somebody come in uh, and to, to test and to see information about underinflating the tire, whether this had any bearing upon the case. Um, but the expert in this case was unreliable in terms of didn't have any expertise in this field. And the tests that he used were really pretty, um, pretty weird uh, in a lot of respects. I mean, he just went out and tried some general things. It would be like going and buying half a dozen Kumo tires and just seeing, seeing what they did when he put them on cars. I mean, it, wasn't much, it wasn't much more than that in many respects. So the analogy is it's a batter designing his own strike zone. So the, the court uh, found in favor of, of Kumo, in, in, at least in terms of the expert testimony, and said that uh, an expert witness must employ the same level of inte intellectual uh, rigor that characterizes um, all the practice of an expert in the field. So even though that means, if I take it to the extreme, even though somebody is an expert in a particular field and qualified as an expert, their opinion must be consistent with what any expert in that field would basically say. They can't go out on a limb. And they can't design really offbeat experiments. Uh, they have to apply the same level of rigor um, that, that any expert in the field would do. Okay. So that, that just basically says that we, we, we have to have some standards uh, of, of what's going on. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, Daubert is used in um, all federal cases. And about half of the cases use uh, half of the courts, state courts, use the Daubert standard, um, and again, most of, most of the local courts use the Fry standard for determining this, this stuff. Here's just a list if you want to see what's going on here. The, the ones on the left are the, those accepting the Daubert. The, the ones in the middle are the ones accepting the Fry standard. New York State is still a Fry state, so this, the standard that we use in New York State was established in 1923, and it hasn't changed since then. And then um, this last group is sometimes called the Fry Plus, um, which is kind of a hybrid between the Fry and the Daubert. It's got, it's got some, some, some features of each. But um, at least that's, that's, that's the last list that I saw, which is 2000, uh, two, 2004. So it's a little surprising the states should find on the Fry only standards. OK, that, those cases form the basis for what is allowable in court in terms of scientific testimony, forensic evidence, and expert witnesses. And if you remember, what we're talking about here all goes to that purpose. The goal of forensic science is to inform the court. And if the evidence or the testimony that you have is not allowable in court, it has no value. Right. So, so the goal then of all those things is to say this is the foundation, this is what we allow in. So I want to talk, change, change it a little bit now and talk about um, what a forensic scientist will do. And then we're going to kind of finish up this little introduction, give you a rough idea of some of the areas that uh, forensic analysis goes into. And then we'll go into talking about crime scene and physical evidence. Right. So the crimes, crime labs have been around for a very long time. Crime labs are the places where evidence is brought back. And whatever analysis you're looking for, chemical analysis, microscopic, physical analysis, whatever, uh, is, is then done in these crime labs. They haven't been around all that long in, in many respects. Uh, Ed Edmund Locard, the fellow who did Locard's principle, set up the first laboratories. Um, in the intervening years, there's something like 320 
forensic labs around the country. Uh, the New York State Police, uh, their main laboratory is in uh, Albany, and then they have four satellite um, smaller labs around the state uh, that, that handle specific kinds of evidence, to give you an example. The FBI laboratories, um, crime lab, are, are among the oldest. Um, I believe that was established in the, in the late 1920s. So they haven't been around as long as you might, as you might think. So why do we have crime labs? What's, what's the purpose of crime labs? Well, crime labs handle physical evidence. From the time that it is um, found at a crime scene and documented appropriately, it is then transported to the crime lab, and then they have responsibility for the analysis, the, s the preservation, storage, and um, handling of all these kinds of uh, physical evidence. So there's been a lot of, of, of um, use of physical evidence, and it's increasing <laughs> almost exponentially because people are much more aware and are much better trained in terms of how to handle physical evidence. When you process a crime scene, what do you bring back? So, so there's been quite a bit of use uh, on that. Crime labs also do, obviously, chemical analysis, biochemical analysis. <coughs> And um, with the increase in the um, use, or I guess would say, the convictions of drugs-based um, um, crimes, um, there's a lot of need for, for chemical analysis. Something like 80% of all crimes are associated with drugs or alcohol. So in all of those cases requires an analysis. Requires analysis of what the drug is, and in some cases, uh, how much of it is present. The Supreme Court also, this is all the reason why there is a proliferation of uh, crime labs and necessary prol proliferation, is that there are rights that, rights that the defendant has. And that this, is, this ensures, you know some of these, the right to counsel, but also um, the reliance upon scientific testimony, scientific evidence, both from the prosecution and from the defense side. Um, they have the right to the, this kind of evidence. So there's been a great need for, for more and more evidence there. And then finally, this last point is that there's been a really uh, rapid growth in the things that we can do in terms of analysis. 30 years ago, in a crime lab, there were certain techniques that you could do. Uh, now there are far more things that are available. A uh, great, great um, example is DNA, DNA analysis. Okay, so DNA analysis is a pretty um, intensive analysis. I'll show you how that works a little bit later. But um, because we have all these new techniques and new methods for, for doing analysis, you have to have the instrumentation. Okay. Okay. Why do we worry about, oops, why do we worry about, um, uh, evidence in terms of, of uh, its handling, its use. We'll talk a little bit about that a bit. But you have to make, sh make sure that the evidence, you know exactly where the evidence came from uh, and how it's been handled all through its existence from the crime scene through the crime lab uh, and all the way uh, beyond in terms of storage. There are lots of examples of mishandling of this. One of the classic cases uh, which we'll talk about is the O.J. Simpson trial in which evidence was both tampered but also mishandled. Um, and that, when evidence is mishandled, that evidence loses its value because you don't know where it was, who handled it, how it was analyzed. And so if there's any mishandling, misuse of this stuff, uh, its, it's, 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 youth, it's um, uh, value quickly goes away. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about the evidence, the physical evidence itse itself. The hardest thing I think that you will experience when you're visiting a mock crime scene or, ex or processing a mock crime scene is uh, deal with this first point. Before you can do anything with evidence, you have to identify it. That means you have to see something, physical evidence, that is associated with the crime as opposed to just being laying around. If you have a crime scene that's, let's say, outside, and you see things like bottles and you know, um, candy wrappers and all kinds of stuff, um, 
well, does that stuff have anything to do with the crime? Maybe, maybe not. You first have to, so you have first have to identify that it has some relationship to what you're interested in, and then you have to properly collect it, document it, handle it, package it, and transport it. So the important thing there is that I, once you identify it, it is handled properly through the entire process. Okay. Um, and then evidence technicians have a number of responsibilities that they have to deal with too in terms of what they can and what they, what they need and what they must do. So they have to um, process it from the, from the crime scene all the way through. Okay. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of units. Now, in, in a small police department, they may not have any of these specialized um, um, people, any of these specialized jobs. In a larger metropolitan area like New York City and you know, B Boston, Washington, probably they have these units uh, readily available to them. But these are just some of the kinds of expertise that you would, might want depending upon the circumstances and nature of the crime. So biology, firearms, uh, document examination, probably you'll, uh, in a typical crime scene, you need a few of these, not all of these. Depends upon what, you, what, what you're looking for. So if you're looking for something with, uh, and you've got bones, or maybe you need a forensic odontologist, that's a dentist, forensic anthropologist, maybe a biological unit, certainly a photography unit. Right. If, if it's a different kind of a crime, you'll need different kinds of, different kinds of expertise. So when we're talking about evidence, um, I'm going to kind of break it down a little bit. Physical evidence is any kind of evidence that we can collect at, 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 at a crime scene. Um, but I'll sp specifically break that down into two separate sub-areas here. Chemical evidence, biological evidence. Now there are other kinds of physical evidence like impression evidence, I'm not going to talk about that. But, but specifically chemical and, 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 and biological evidence. Being pre when we're presented with this kind of evidence, the question is, what is the composition um, and where did it come from? In other words, identity and then origin. So we have a variety of techniques uh, that we'll be talking about through the course of this semester about what you can use to try to answer those questions. Things like spectroscopy, which means shining light on something and seeing how the light is changed by that substance. And if I know how the light is changed by that substance, uh, absorbed or transmitted or maybe even wavelength shifted, I can get information about what that stuff is. It's a really nice, non-invasive, non-destructive method for figuring out. Uh, we can also use chromatography. You'll do that in lab. You, you may have done that also elsewhere. Chromatography basically says, I, I'm going to try to separate things out because in life, we tend to find things as complex mixtures of things. But in order to do the analysis, we have to separate them into their individual components. Okay. There, so there's a lot of analysis that we'll do in the chemical and biological evidence thing. We'll do that in lab. But before I can even talk more about physical evidence, we first have to talk about the physical properties of matter. So the, the, this, is, this is some stuff that you probably uh, have had before, but it's, it's, um, it's a good review. So, how do we define matter? Matter is defined scientifically as anything that will occupy space that has mass. Pretty straightforward. There are actually more than three states of matter, but three are, are all the ones we're going to worry about here. Um, a gas, liquid, and a solid. So we define these as a gas has no fixed shape, no fixed volume, and it's compressible. A liquid, fixed volume, Pretty much incompressible, but no fixed shape. You can pour it in any container you want, it'll, it'll take up that, that, that size and shape. And a solid is fixed volume, fixed shape, and it also is pretty much incompressible. Right. So you know th those things, just think of a gas or a liquid or a solid, and, and these, these properties should pretty quickly come to mind. When we think about matter in terms of stuff that will occupy volume and occup uh, occupy space and has mass, talk about compounds and substances. So this, we're going to talk about substances either as a pure, uh, as a pure or sim simple, single substance. And that means that it has a fixed composition with distinct properties. That means, and this may sound silly, but a lot of the population don't believe this. Um, and that is that if I have a particular compound, such as 
take an example, vitamin C, ascorbic acid. That the ascorbic acid, as a pure compound, has a set of physical properties associated with it, and chemical properties. And it doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter what its origin is. Vitamin C, ascorbic acid, is ascorbic acid. And what I said that a lot of people don't necessarily b believe this is if I were to walk up to somebody on the street and say, here, look, I have two bottles of vitamin C. This one I isolated from rose hips, and it's pure vitamin C. Versus this one I synthesized in the laboratory, and it's pure vitamin C. Which one do you want to take? Well, most people would say, well, they're different, right? The, the, I'll, I'll take the one from the natural source, the, the, the rose hips. Doesn't matter. They're exactly the same. There is no difference between those compounds. Vitamin C here is the same as every other place in the universe, and it doesn't matter its origin. So that's the point. As a fixed set of, comp as a fixed set of properties, chemical and physical properties, that depend only upon the compound. Okay? Um, now, when we talk about a compound, we talk about a set of physical properties, a set of chemical properties. These are easy to understand, um, but again, don't get confused by them. Physical properties are properties that we can measure without changing something. So think of water. I can, change, I can measure the melting point of ice. I can measure the boiling point of water. I can measure its color. Uh, I can look at a variety, its viscosity, its density. I can do all those kinds of measurements. Those are physical properties because in measuring the melting point of ice, I haven't changed the water at all. It's still water. Okay. Chemical properties, though, are different. Chemical properties are properties associated with a chemical reaction. reaction. So if I were to start with glucose and, and react it with oxygen, I'll make carbon dioxide and water. So the process of looking at that chemical property, I've changed it. I've changed glucose into carbon dioxide and water. So, um, for example, baking is an example of a chemical, pro chemical process. If I think about a baked potato, when I, when I take a baked potato and I bake it, and I take it out of the oven at a cool room temperature, and I hand you an uncooked potato and a cooked potato, both at the same temperature, you can tell which one is which, right? One is squishy, that's the one you've cooked. The other one is hard, and the difference is chemical reactions have occurred on baking. So baking, cooking, is a chemical process. If I were to look at the color uh, of the potato, though, that, that's, that's a physical property. Okay? So it's important to keep track of which, which, which is which. So these, here are a few examples. Uh, on the left are, are chemical properties. Uh, on the right are physical properties. So on the right we have things like sublimation, which is going directly from a uh, solid to a gas. Uh, dissolution means dissolving it up in water. I can take sodium chloride, dissolve it in water. And I still have sodium chloride. I haven't changed it. I've just dissolved it, um, melting all the, the variety of other things we talked about. The chemical changes, burning, combustion reactions, other chemical reactions like, so, like sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride, that's actually s related to the chemistry you do in your stomach when you take an antacid. You are, you are neutralizing the acid, so you make water and salt. Corrosion is an example of a chemical process that goes on all the time. It's a chemical reaction. So substances, let's go back to define this a little more in detail, that we can talk about elements, we can talk about compounds. So substances that cannot be decomposed further with normal chemical means, we define as elements. And if you've had chemistry before, you know that there is the periodic table which defines all the chemicals, the basic building blocks that chemists have to use to put together to make compounds. Okay, so these are elements or things that we, under normal conditions, can't break down further. Compounds, though, are things that, um, where we bring together atoms and elements together um, to make larger arrays, larger substances. But we can take compounds and break them down further into their component elements. So a compound is made of, of uh, putting together uh, elements. So the periodic table is the best cheat sheet in the world. It, it, it gives, in terms of chemistry, it gives you all the information about all the elements that you'll ever need. There are about 110 known elements uh, out there at this point. Um, and the, uh, the atoms themselves of, of an element are made up of subatomic particles. But for most chemical reactions that we're talking about, we're going to talk about, about putting uh, atoms together, although the electrons are critically important. 
Okay, so what, what is a compound? A compound is combining elements in a definite proportion. What does that mean? Well, that means that if I'm going to make, use my example, water. In water, I bring together one oxygen and two hydrogens. Not one oxygen and 1.3 hydrogens. It brings together uh, these things in a definite composition, a definite way. So water, every place in the universe, is H2O. Right? Th there's, a definite, there's a definite proportion bringing these things together. Now, I can make other molecules based upon hydrogen oxygen. I can make H2O2. That's hydrogen peroxide. Right? So it, that's a different compound than, than water. But it still is a definite proportion, a definite way that I bring them together. It's not just, just this random thing. That would be really confusing if that were the case. Okay. Now, the properties of compounds are different than their constituent elements. So if I take uh, classic examples, take sodium chloride, salt, which we all consume a lot of. Uh, if I look at the basic elements, sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is a very toxic gas. Sodium, if you've ever seen this, is a very reactive metal. If I throw it in water, it actually dances around, even can, even can break into flames. But put those two together to make sodium chloride, and I have a water-soluble, stable, safe-to-eat compound. Right. Now, we can take compounds and bring them together to make mixtures. And the reason I'm talking about this is because most of the time in life, we deal with mixtures of compounds, which just complicates our lives. Uh, because if we'd like to know, does this sample contain a particular compound? Does this sample, sample contain cyanide? Well, the problem is it's typically messed in with a whole bunch of other compounds um, that uh, we have to separate them out. But when we have a mixture, this is important, we have a mixture that the individual compounds retain their own identities. They haven't reacted. So if I take salt and sand and um, uh, uh, mix them together, it's now a mixture. But in this mixture, the salt molecules, or actually not molecules, but the salt grains um, are different than the sand. And they retain their properties of being salt. They don't, they don't react, in other words. So a mixture is, a, is putting together a bunch of compounds that really haven't reacted. And there are two kinds of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homo meaning the same, so a homogeneous means all looks the same. Heterogeneous means different, so it looks different. So if I bring together a mixture that's homogeneous, uh, then I can't see the individual compounds. An example of this is what we're breathing right now. The air that you're breathing is a homogeneous mixture. It's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen mainly, but also mixed in there are small amounts of helium and argon and carbon dioxide and water and a bunch of other stuff. Okay? So that we're actually breathing in a homogeneous mixture. When you look at air, you don't say, oh, look, there goes an oxygen by, there goes nitrogen. No, you, don't, you can't see the individual components. Um, mix salt and water. There's salt in there, there's water in there. We can separate them out, but it looks the same. A heterogeneous mixture is something that, under a microscope or something, I can actually see the differences. I can, if I take iron filings and sand, put them together, I can see that they're different. And I can say this is a heterogeneous mixture. So one of the things that we're faced with in chemical analysis or forensic analysis is we have to separate uh, mixtures into their individual compounds. And the reason for that is because our methods of analysis uh, are pretty much focused on the identity of, of one compound at a time. It's, it's very difficult to identify multiple things at one time. So we've got to be able to say, here's our, here's our mixture that we get from the world. We now have to separate into each of its components. Then I can do the analysis of each component. I can tell you, this one is salt, this one's water, that, okay, whatever. Um, so how do we separate these things? Sometimes we take use of chemical properties. Lots of times we take use of physical properties. So here's an example of, of physical properties, how we can separate them. Um, if I have salt and sand, I can, I can use solubility and filtration. So I pour in water. The salt dissolves, the sand doesn't dissolve, I filter it, the sand stays on the filter, the salt goes through with the water, and then I can evaporate the water to get the salt. So, so I can use that, uh, the, the water and salt. Um, solubility is another one. Copper uh, chloride and iodine, I, uh, one is soluble in, in, in a solvent, the other one is not. 
That's basically the goal here. So I get one to all dissolve in one solvent. The other one dissolves in, let's say, the other solvent. One might dissolve entirely uh, in organic solvents. And the other one might dissolve in, and not dissolve in water. And the other component will dissolve, copper chloride will dissolve in water, but not in organic solvents. Okay. A lab that you're going to be doing involves chromatography, which allows us to separate things by how much they interact with a solid or a liquid or a gas. And if you've ever done this in high school, we looked at like uh, pen, ink, or lipstick, or things like that. You put on a piece of paper and let some solvent go through it. it separates things into different colors. Um, that's chromatography. Um, iron and gold, this is used magnetic properties. Take a magnet over top. You can pull out the iron filings. Uh, this would be the equivalent of ever, ever seen the cereal that says iron fortified cereal. You buy the store. Take a magnet sometime if you haven't done this. The, the way they iron, they, they mag, the way they fortify the cereal with iron is they put iron filings in the cereal. It's nothing fancy. It's iron, little, little tiny pieces of iron that they put, they put in there. So if you take a magnet and, and put it around in your cornflakes and pull it out, your magnet will be covered with iron filings that they put in your cereal. That's how they fortify your cereal. Um, so, but, but what you've done is there, if I'd done the experiment, is you've done the separation of, of iron filings from the, cheer, from the Cheerios or the cornflakes. All right, I'm skipping over this. That just, we were talking about this. All right, so what does a forensic scientist do? As we get towards the end of this introduction part here. Um, they examine the evidence and determine through that examination what information you need. Just like a doctor. If you go to a doctor's office and you have a certain complaint, so they'll examine you and they'll say, um, I think we need a blood test. Or I think we need a throat culture. They don't, when you walk into the doctor's office, they don't run every test that's possible on you just because you walked in. No, what they do is they figure out what makes sense. Uh, we need throat culture. Well, that's what a forensic scientist does. The evidence walks in the door. They examine it. They look it over and say, oh, all right, we need a chemical analysis, a, a GC mass spectral analysis. Or we need a melting point or a fractive index or whatever it is. They decide what is needed, and then perform the appropriate analysis. That's, that's uh, sometimes the hard part, is getting the analysis done. And then once they have the data, they have to somehow interpret it so that the rest of the world can understand what it is. Like, oh yes, this is cocaine, or no, it's not. Um, and give some indication of their level of certainty, like, I'm 99.99% sure that this is cocaine, let's say. Uh, or 50-50. I mean, they have to put some, some, um, some, some me measure on that thing. And then occasionally they're, they're, they're called upon to testify in court. Okay. Now, in terms of measurements, because that's what forensic scientists do. They measure things. And as mentioned, Lord Kelvin once said, you don't know something until you measure it. There are two terms that are really important. Precision and accuracy. And these are very different meanings. Precision means how close your measurements agree to one another. And accuracy means how close your measurements agree to the true answer. So you can, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you an example of what I mean by this. So precision is how, much, how close they are together. Accuracy is how close they are to the real answer. So here's kind of a silly picture. Here's a guy playing darts. Um, the one in the left, upper left, where he has all the darts in the bullseye, and they're all close to, clustered close together, that is good precision and good accuracy. Good precision because they're all pretty close together, good accuracy because they're all pretty close to the right answer, which is the bullseye. Okay, you look at this, this one in the middle over here. This is an example of poor uh, accuracy. Missed the target, or missed the goal quite a bit. But good precision because they're all right in the same place. Maybe his sights are off a little bit, so you just move the sights over. But this is good precision, poor accuracy. This one over here uh, is poor precision and poor accuracy. They're kind of all over the place. Now, one of the um, places that people get messed up is that it is possible to have terrible precision. Numbers can be all over the place. And then when you average them out, they can actually come out to pretty close to the right answer. That's just luck. 
I mean, that's not any scientific valid, uh, scientifically valid way of doing things. So you, it's possible to have really terrible precision, and the average answer can be just about right. Okay. So the, it, it's important to know the difference bet, bet, between these terms. Now, something I'm not going to belabor, because I know you've all had this more than you ever care to again, um, and that's the issue of significant figures. Significant figures are numbers that have meaning, that have significance. So, the, so, what is, so what does this mean? Well, we have to relate, uh, and we found a way to relate to other people, other scientists, and, and in this case also the court, to be able to relate to them to say, this is the level of precision that I was able to measure this value. And so the way we do that is by using these things called significant figures. It's based upon the idea that at some level, all measurements are intrinsically inaccurate. You can never get exactly the right answer because there's something uh, in our measurement system. And it could be just some experimental error. It could be uh, if you know, your visual eye, if you're looking at to measure the length of something. It could be something intrinsic. Your ruler could not be accurate. It might not be exactly accurate, whatever. Um, so there's some intrinsic measurement. And the way, that, the way that we take this into account is by telling people how inaccurate our measurement was by looking at the last figure, the last number uh, in, in whatever number I write down. That last, that last place tells you um, that's the level of accuracy. I think I have an example. Oh, I guess I don't. So if I were to write a number, or I mean, let me do this versus this. OK, so those numbers, to some extent, look the same, right? 0 0.001, 0 0.00100. So the question is, um, in terms of what level of accuracy I measured this thing to. So the idea of significant figures means that the last digit, the farthest one to the right, is, th is the one that I have measured. Um, that's the one that I have uncertainty in. So in this case, this is the, this is the one in question. And this one, this one is the one in question. So in this case, this thing has three significant figures. So I have measured this number, plus or minus 0 0.0000, let's say, 1. I've measured this one, plus or minus 0 0.001. It's a big difference. This, is, this number is much more. Uh, at, at a much more accurate level than that is this one. Okay. Because these, these numbers over here are just um, placeholders. They don't mean anything. It's the last one to the right that matters. So I, I, I know you've been through this but, but before, but the issue is that significant figures allow us to tell very quickly somebody else the level of our accuracy. Okay. All right, so the question then becomes, what is evidence? What are we going to be talking about in, in terms of forensic science? Well, it deals with evidence. Evidence is any information that um, can somehow influence the beliefs of the observer. In this case, the observer is the court. That, court, that could be the judge, the judge and the jury, whatever. And evidence is only evidence when it is relevant to a specific legal question. Um, and that means that it's only evidence if it relates to the, to the issue at hand. You have all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff that you collect at a crime scene that can be completely irrelevant. It's not evidence. O only if it bears upon the question at hand. So the, the ev it must be relevant. And it also must be, these are terms that, uh, legal terms, probative versus prejudicial, prejudicial. So probative means that it actually is, we're, we're probing something. We're, we're, we're trying to, to, to get at a piece of fact. We're trying to get at some, some understanding of this thing. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with science. Prejudicial is, re is really very different. Prejudicial talks about, well, um, this person did a crime before. 
so they're likely to do the same crime again. Well, that's, that's not based upon the scientific idea of the, of the data, the, the evidence that's before us. It deals with a more prejudicial point of view. So to evidence, specifically evidence, in this case, deals with uh, probative things. OK, so what do we try to do? Try to establish that a particular person was at a particular place at a specific time. If you can do that, the attorneys will just love it. Because that, that's, that's the key issue. Was this person at the crime scene at the time that it was supposedly committed? If you can place the person there at the right time, you've gone probably 95% of the way to, 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 to solving the issue at hand. OK. Um, establish that something was done with a particular tool, like a bullet, knife, whatever. And to establish a relationship between people. In other words, are they related? Are they not related? OK. This slide is wrong, as it turns out. Um, there's, there, there's something wrong in this slide. And it's something wrong fundamentally and scientifically. Can you think of something that, or in each of these, that, that they might consider to be wrong? What's, 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 what's not right in, in each of these cases, in each of these instances? They all, look, they all pretty much look the same. To establish a particular person, establish something that's done with a tool, establish a relationship between people. Um, okay, just kind of Go ahead. Ah, that's okay. What do you think? Any, any thoughts? Well, I, I kind of hinted at it yesterday, but remember I said that science um, and the law are at odds at times because science has never proven anything beyond simple facts. We can talk about hypotheses, we can test them, we can test them to the point that they become theories and well, well believed and well thought of, but we can't prove, we still can't even prove that there are electrons around atoms. Um, one of the fundamental ideas, we, we, can, we can say the vast, vast body of information supports it. So the problem with that slide is that science is a process that tests things, and which means that we can't establish anything. We can't prove anything. Um, so what science is really good at is, is falsifying thing, things. So we can say, no, that's not right. We know that's not right. We can't say this other thing is necessarily true. What we can say, though, is that it's likely. Uh, it's likely that this blood sample came from this person. And I could say that the odds of a random match in the population might be 1 in 10 billion. That was almost the case in the OJ. I think it was 1 in 7 billion. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 1 in 7 trillion, I think it was, um, of a random match for that blood sample. Okay, but we can't say that blood came from OJ. We can't do that. Uh, what we can say, it's, it's likely. In fact, it's extraordinarily likely with a very, very small probability of error. So, so what was wrong with that, that, that slide was that we can't establish anything. But we can test whether a, a particular person was at a place at a time. We can test whether it was done with a particular tool. We can test whether a relationship exists. That's, that's the important part. The legal system wants uh, uh, the scientists to come in and said, that blood sample came from that person. That tool did the crime. That person was there. That's what the legal system wants. Scientific world cannot provide that. We can say it's likely this is the high probability or the low probability, and leave it up to the court. So let me give you an example. If you were on a jury and, and, and you were going to convict somebody, let's say, of, of murder, and I have a blood sample. So I do two tests. Right? The first test I come in and, find, and I do a, a, a blood typing. You're probably familiar with that, A, B, O, uh, A, B uh, blood types. Okay, so let's say that I say the person is um, um, A, B positive. And let's say that that is 3% of the population has it. So the person and the blood sample I have on the crime scene match. They both have the same blood type. And that, that f the, 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 the chance of a random match in the population is 3%. Okay. 
You're the jury. Is that enough to convict somebody to say that blood sample came from that guy? Probably not, right? 3%? That's a lot of people. That means you take 100 people, three people are going to match. What if I take the same blood sample and said I, I, I ran a 14 probe DNA analysis and I came out and said that, that the chance of a random match, just finding somebody off the street to match, is one in seven trillion. You know, there's only six billion people on the earth. One in seven trillion. Uh, is that enough to convict somebody? I think most juries would probably say yes in that case. Um, but the, the, the difference is, 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 the, is the, um, the, uh, the uncertainty, or how likely is it that this sample came from that particular person. That's what science can do. It can say, yes, they, yes, they have information, uh, that they're the same blood type, or, or they match DNA profiles, and here are the chances of a random match. So that's, that's what we can do. Up. Goes to sleep every once in a while. Yep. There we go. All right. So in the, just just a couple minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the techniques that we are going to cover um, in in this. So we're going to be doing microscopy. Um, in in the laboratory, you'll be looking at hairs and fibers uh, from you and others, but also from a large variety of animals. In fact, we even have 40,000-year-old wool, woolly mammoth hair, if you, know, if you ever want to look at that. It, that, that. That may seem bizarre. Why would we look at these things? Well, it turns out lots of crimes have been, um, I would say, solved by finding rabbit hair or mink hair or some other thing uh, where it wasn't supposed to be. So, you have to, so, so we'll look at, at uh, microscopic analysis. You can also look at comparison. If you've seen, if you watch CSI or other shows, we'll compare bullets from a test-fired bullet and one found at the crime scene, and look to see if they match up. Again, we'll talk about these in detail as we get going. So, so we'll, we'll we'll talk about comparison and other kinds of microscopy. We'll look at firearms in terms of the chemical um, analysis that we can do there. That can include things like gunshot residue, find out what are the components, maybe figure out what kind of powder it is. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about measurements of the bullets um, and, uh, and the things associated with ballistics. Um, and that's, that's where this comes from. Uh, t this, is, this is gunshot residue. This, this stuff gets all over the place. We can do a chemical analysis, microscopic analysis. We'll do those kinds of things. Um, we'll talk about glass and paint in terms of, again, their chemical composition, but also in terms of their physical properties. Uh, how they interact with light, what kinds of pigments are there, those kinds of things. Refractive index, density. Uh, fingerprints, there's lots of things we're going to do. Fingerprints, hopefully, then we'll run a lab and you'll be able to tell the difference between arched and whorls and a few other little things. It's really pretty straightforward stuff, but uh, it's kind of interesting when you, when you compare them. Uh, we have chemical compounds. How do you know this is salt or glucose or um, other kinds of things, because this, this works not just in a forensic setting, but think about a biomedical setting. If you're in an emergency room and somebody comes in unconscious and they say, look, we found this white powder next to, ne next to the person, um, your course of treatment as a physician or as an emergency room person depends upon what is that stuff? Is it cocaine? Is it caffeine? Is it sugar? Maybe the person's diabetic. You know, you have to know those kinds of things. It's the same kind of thing now in a legal setting. What is, what is that stuff that was found in this traffic stop? So we have to be able to do a chemical analysis, and there are many, many techniques that we'll talk about there. Impression analysis, footwear, uh, fingerprints, that's hair and fiber. We'll do chromatography, um, that's separating things in terms of their um, chemical properties. Paper chromatography, the kind you've probably done before, but we'll also do things like GC mass spectrometry, which is kind of the workhorse of, of forensic science. It's on every CSI episode I think you'll ever see. Um, here's, here's the mass spectrometer. Actually, we've got um, a new one that, that, that you'll be playing with um, to, to run some analysis. You'll run cocaine analysis for the money in your pockets. I think you'll be surprised to find out what, how many in, people in here currently have cocaine in their pockets and there's no way you can get rid of it. <laughs> Nuclear magnetic resonance, we'll talk about MRI. These, these are biomedical methods for looking at important autopsy or physical remains. This is an MRI scan, a 
of head. Um, also, chemical, chemical tests. These are, these are tests that allow us to find the presence of blood or other kinds of, of reagents. This is luminol. This is the stuff that you see them spritz around on television. Um, and then we'll shine light to try to determine if there is blood there and how much and where. Um, here, here, here's an example of luminol. Um, this has been spritzed, uh, over this blood, but you can't see it, been spritzed and they shine light on it, uh, ultraviolet light, and you can actually see where it was because it reacts specifically and then uh, glows when you shine light on it. Talk, of course, about DNA, serology, blood analysis, body fluids, those kinds of chemical uh, analyses. Um, here's an, just an example of a DNA marker that, w that, that by the end of the class, you'll be able to look at that and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. I understand that. Okay. We'll even do forensic entomology, which is the use of bugs, insects, for determining important things like time of death, movement of body, environmental conditions, things like that. So we're going to hit a lot of different things uh, through, through the course. These are just a few and many more.